holding the powerful accountable. It's our mission here on the News 12 Investigates team. Welcome to the 2023 special. I'm Tyler Harden. We've received hundreds of your calls, texts, and tips leading to stories that have made a difference in your community. From demanding answers to high energy and water bills to unraveling artificial intelligence and even sparking new leads in cold cases. Our team has traveled all over Eastern Carolina from Pitt County to Pink Hill, Atlantic Beach to Kinston, even taking a trip down the Noose River in New Bern. Well, all of this would not have been possible without fellow investigator Frank Ferboni. He retired from News 12 in November after more than 40 years in this industry. We start with the story Frank shared with us in August. It's about a Lenore County man who, until Frank stepped in, waited years to get his stolen property back. Three men stole three guns out of a locked cabinet in Jimmy Overton's garage in July of 2020. Kinston police caught the three suspects the same night after they crashed a car into a nearby home. Well, fast forward to this year, Overton was still without his guns. Investigators said the guns were considered evidence to be collected, tested and maintained for court. But because of the pandemic, there was a backlog in cases and delays. Overton finally had one of his guns released after Frank asked questions. The others were lost or destroyed in the crash. The suspects are still moving through the court system. And this brings us to a startling trend state leaders with the juvenile justice program are noticing more children turning to criminal activities in the shadows of growing gangs. As I found out in February, it's at a peak across eastern Carolina. From the school, you were saying it. From the classroom to the streets. When you come home, you were saying it. Brandon so Anderson became a part of it. A street gang. Yeah, I wanted to prove that I was just as tough as everybody else. He was only 14 years old when he was initiated. Over time, he rose through the ranks. It took me to a, a place I didn't want to live for a long time. Three separate attempted murder charges put him in prison for a combined nine years. Every time I've been in prison, I lost somebody that was close to me. The losses pushed him to stop. Now he's seeing a new, more destructive generation of gangs. Kids, like younger kids, not even in high school, they the OGs, they the ones teaching the other kids to do this and do that. I think we've seen kids get um, more violent in the middle school, which is something that we really need to focus on. Dealing drugs, robberies, assaults, shootings, even murders, Jacksonville Police Chief Mike Yanero says children as young as 12 years old are committing these crimes. Because these gangs develop their own rules, they develop their own culture, and it just depends on that culture. There are more than 300 validated gang members living in Jacksonville. Since 2020, police investigated 141 gang-related incidents, including murder. That culture is a culture of crime. It's a culture of violence, and we need to we need to stop that. We need to turn that around. Other Eastern Carolina cities are similar. Greenville police report 10 gangs operate in the city, including the notorious Bloods and Crips. Those same two gangs were found in Kinston, too, where police reveal 106 shootings since 2020 were gang related. That's more than 60 percent of the shootings there. From 2019 to 2021, New Bern police investigated 21 gang related shootings, resulting in seven deaths. So what we see with gang members is they fail in school, they fail in sports, and this is an opportunity for them to, to get self-esteem. About 40% of them have parents that say they're unwilling or incapable of supervising their own children. And so instead of the parents supervising those kids, the kids are turning towards the gangs. Something leaders at the North Carolina juvenile justice system want to prevent early on. William Lasseter is the deputy secretary. He follows the troubling trends. The gangs got a foothold in a lot of our communities. It shows in the combined data across Pitt, Lenore, Craven and Onslow counties. In 2020, 11% of juveniles entering the system were involved in gangs. The number was higher in 2021. It was 14%. In 2022, there was a slight drop. 12% of juveniles were gang affiliated. To put it in perspective, that's 127 children, 17 years old or younger last year. If we can get catch them in that first year where they're considering to join a gang, um, we still have a pretty good chance of keeping them out of that gang culture for life. That's why each child 12 and older takes a gang assessment when they enter the system. Staff look for physical signs like hand signals, tattoos on their body or face, or the use of gang colors. They're even asked 13 questions. One of them cuts to the chase. Are you involved in a gang? 
Deputy Secretary Lassiter says these questions help shape their service plan and possibly the rest of their life. If that kid stays in that gang for more than a year, um, two or three years, it's much more difficult to get them out of that gang culture. Give these kids opportunities to excel in other means and the problems of gangs will go away. From team sports to the theater stage, even mentorship programs, it's these opportunities law enforcement and even reformed gang members hope will help. The way it's going now, it'll lead you back to prison. It'll lead you to prison or in the early grade. Talk to the kids before they get there and let them know to make the right decision and the best decisions before they even get into it so they won't get into it. While some crimes go unsolved, one caught our attention in Atlantic Beach. It was the first murder in the town in more than a decade, the third in its history. Longtime visitor Randy Miller was fatally stabbed while preparing for a fishing trip early one morning in August 2022. This mysterious murder happened under the watch of Atlantic Beach Police Chief Jeff Harvey. He said the biggest break in the case, home surveillance video of the suspects and a grainy image of the getaway vehicle outside a business. And since we aired this three part investigation in August, Chief Harvey says tips have come into the police station. All it takes is one phone call to make a difference. If you want us to look into a story, contact the News 12 Investigates team by calling or emailing us. I fear every month, what is the bill going to be? Is it going to be another hurdle? They keep going up and up and up. Well, save me some money. That's all I ask. Save me some money. Electricity and water, utility bills we all have to pay, but what happens when you're concerned about how much you're paying and for the product itself? We've heard from people all over Eastern Carolina with these exact problems. Back in July, our News 12 Investigates team searched for solutions after a Craven County man revealed his power company, Duke Energy Progress, was overcharging him for service. When a contractor built Stephen out in Offie's house in Ernal, they installed one power meter inside the home and the other on his detached garage. Duke Energy Progress char charged him for both meters separately, so he got two power bills. The garage was charged a higher non-residential rate than his home, a problem he had faced for years. Before calling the News 12 Investigates team, he complained to the public staff at the North Carolina Utilities Commission. We have had customers inquire and, and complain about that from time to time over the years. And I think uh, the company has probably had more customers complain. The complaints turned into compromise. Duke Energy Progress got approval to up their rates, but now customers can request detached garages be priced at the residential level. Well, from transformer to the tap, water is a necessity hundreds of people in a Carteret County community are raising concerns about. You're, you're backed against the wall. You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice but Carolina Water Service. That's the situation for hundreds of people living in the Brandywine Bay community outside the Moorhead city limits. Dozens of residents reached out to the News 12 Investigates team about constantly dirty and troubling water quality mixed with excessively high bills, sometimes reaching the thousands. Carolina Water Service, a private company, is the only provider there. One resident said her bill was nearly $900 over two months, while another said he's forced to cut back on other necessities like groceries. Well, the oldest regulatory body in our state, the Utilities Commission controls the rates and services of private water companies like Carolina Water Service. As I found out in November, company leaders went before the commission last year to make a special request, one that residents are now paying for. I will call for hearing now docket number W354 sub 400. In 2022, the North Carolina Utilities Commission approved a portion of the Carolina Water Service's request to increase rates over three years. Representatives revealed it was to offset $110 million to improve aging water and wastewater systems serving customers. Our focus is trying to keep people's rates as low as possible while maintaining adequate service. The North Carolina public staff are advocates for consumers during these hearings. Your method focuses on earnings. Yes. Chief Counsel for the Public Staff Lucy Edmondson says there's a legal team, engineers, 
economists, and accountants. She says Carolina Water Service has a monopoly over Brandywine Bay. The private ones are generally higher. You don't have the economies of scale. They have to pay taxes, whereas the municipals aren't subject to the same income taxes. Since 2020, the public staff has received six informal complaints about Carolina Water Service in Carteret County. Four from Brandywine Bay residents concerned about water quality, high rates, and a misread meter. All cases are now closed. Has Carolina Water Service been responsive to consumer complaints? Yes, to my knowledge. I don't know of any, um, any that they have not been. One, one item that the commission looks at is the quality of service. And that certainly would be bad service if they weren't responsive. After reviewing dozens of monthly bills, Brandywine Bay customers pay a varying base charge, then as much as $13.02 for 1,000 gallons of water, on top of $14.94 for 1,000 gallons of wastewater service. They cannot have discriminatory rates and they cannot um, change rates without approval of the commission. We're kind of stuck because, I mean, if we don't pay it, they're going to turn off the water. You have to have water. So, and, it, and they know that. A necessity, pushing people here to consider a move. When you add it all up, it's like, you know, we could live somewhere else and be a lot happier. And, you know, that water bill isn't haunting us every month. Carolina Water Service representatives told us crews regularly test drinking water to government standards. Sometimes it takes time to get answers and help, like in this case where Hurricane Florence victims are still waiting for help five years later. Watch the award-winning investigation right here on our YouTube channel. will be remembered as the year artificial intelligence went mainstream, but for seven decades this technology was working in the background. Think about autocomplete on your phone, email spam filters, even facial recognition to unlock your phone. The possibilities seem endless and this technology is already a lot like us. Programs can read, write, see, speak, move, hear, and even understand. Chatbots like OpenAI's ChatGPT, Microsoft's Bing Chat, and Google's Bard. It all takes seconds for these systems to solve a complex math problem or write a college essay. We could ask it uh, a question about any topic and it'll mm -hmm. respond. We mm -hmm. could ask it to tell us a story. We can ask it to write code for us. So there's a lot of different stuff we can do with it. AI can generate short stories, news articles, recipes, even presidential speeches in just seconds leaving people to question whether something was created by human or a machine. It's not only text, it's images too, which can be difficult and dangerous. On whichfaceisreal.com, people will see two faces. One is real and one is AI generated. At first glance, you may not be able to tell a difference. Right now, there are just small details you can notice like fingers, ears, hairlines, and accessories like glasses. Many turning out distorted, but AI is getting better and faster. It will soon be harder for people to spot what's real and what's fake. Not to mention there are possibilities of reinforcing social biases, swaying political elections, committing fraud, and spreading misinformation too. This report by the investment bank Goldman Sachs reveals AI could replace 300 million full-time jobs amid creating a productivity boom. I see it as any other tools that we've developed that help us, help us do things even faster, better, and uh, release us from mundane tasks and let us focus on more important things. This fast-moving technology has lawmakers' attention, but there's a learning curve. Recent advancements are quickly transforming our future, potentially threatening people's rights. And there's a series of proposals to rein in artificial intelligence. In October, President Joe Biden even signed an executive order in hopes to develop guidelines for the creation and the use of AI. Companies including OpenAI, Microsoft, and Google commit to developing responsible AI. We break down this technology even further on our YouTube channel. Across our state, families lay their loved ones to rest in graveyards on their own land. They're often spotted in open fields, neighborhoods, and even urban developments. But how did a group of coffins wind up underwater in the Noose River? 
News 12's investigates Frank Ferboni first shared this submerged mystery in May. Beneath the Highway 17 bridge and on and off ramps over the Noose River lies a disturbing sight, the remnants of wooden coffins just beneath the surface. First discovered by kayakers and fishermen a few years ago, the five coffins, where they came from and how they got here, has been a mystery. Using an underwater camera, we took a closer look and shared our discovery with an ECU anthropologist. I, I saw the, the pictures and I said, yeah, those sure look like coffins. Dr. Charles Ewan has worked in the field of historical archaeology for decades. But can you tell anything from looking at them and the shape of them? I would say yeah, they're probably late 19th, early 20th century, just from the, from the looks of them, although they could, could even be earlier. But how could coffins dating back to the 1800s wind up here, just feet from the shoreline on a state-owned piece of property in James City? And he roamed the settlement here. It was 100 acres of land. They built 500 houses. Chairman of the James City Historical Society, William Hollowell, showed us on a map from 1866. The area near the coffins was originally the Trent River Settlement, a community established by the Union Army for freed slaves. He believes it could be a slave graveyard, just like the one found here at Coastal Carolina Regional Airport, called the Far Cemetery. It was found during an archaeological investigation in the 1970s. It's now a memorial park, honoring those buried here and home to the 1850 slave quarters, a project to restore and preserve this slave home from New Bern. Hollowell says these coffins are incredibly close to what was the freed slave settlement. Do you have any suspicion about where they may have come from or what, well, how they got there? Well, I mean, we, we have talked about a couple of things. We talked about the hospital. That hospital was just walking distance from these coffins that appeared to be side by side or in rows. Well, I truly believe that it's a cemetery that was part of the uh, smallpox contraband hospital. Newburn historian Claudia Houston says that hospital was rather large, built to treat freed slaves who were also called contraband of the war and who were dying in large numbers from an outbreak of smallpox. I have what they call morning reports, um, which designates all the areas here and how many people were in the hospital and who died. And within a three-month period, there were over 200 deaths from smallpox. According to the 1866 map of the settlement in James City, the smallpox contraband hospital was right here. When we lay the current map of the highways over the top of that map, we get a clearer picture of the coffin's location and their close proximity to the smallpox hospital. Houston believes a cemetery close to the hospital amid a smallpox epidemic now exposed by years of storms and erosion just makes sense. People were really, really afraid. I mean, they used to burn all the clothes, any, any kind of towel, anything that was used to care for them because it was so contagious. And people didn't know why you got smallpox. They just knew other people got it. So I would think that they would bury them right where they died, unfortunately, and it would be right there. That raises an even more interesting question. Could there be more? It's going to take wading around in the, in the shallows and into the the swampy shoreline to see how far these go. But the big thing, Frank, is now that we know it, what are we going to do? Who's going to help? Hollowell believes it's time someone did something to preserve what could be a part of the area's troubled past. We need to make it right from over, what, 200 years ago? Yeah. North Carolina DOT officials told us they will not disturb the area in question because it could potentially damage the site and anything there. Thank you to all of you who've reached out. If you have a story you want us to investigate in 2024, call, text, or email us with the information you see right here. We're wishing you a great 2024, and remember, our mission is holding the powerful accountable.